what we will do today is um, uh, a brief lecture about uh, cohort studies. So this is the outline of my presentation. What is actually a cohort study? And once you understand that, what are the different types of cohort studies? Uh, and then uh, planning a cohort study. What are the elements we have to plan? Uh, we learn about the advantages and disadvantages and some examples from published literature. Wow. So if you have uh, questions, uh, please comment it in the chat box. I will try to answer them as we go along. So the term cohort is probably familiar to all of us. Uh, this is actually origin in uh, military groups, and, uh, but it's not a medical term to begin with. So we are familiar with the uh, Roman legionaries, the Roman army, the legions, and each legion consisted of several cohorts. So basically it meant a group of soldiers that marched together into a battle. So those who are familiar with the Asterix and Obelix comics are familiar with Roman legionaries. So uh, Dr. Grimes has described a cohort study as a group of subjects followed over a period of time. So basically, just like soldiers marching into war, uh, you have a group of subjects included in a study. They're marching forwards from an exposure, a risk factor to it for a disease, cigarette smoking, obesity, high cholesterol levels, oral concept people use, to an outcome, fracture, uh, cancer of the colon, deep vein thrombosis, whatever it is. So basically, you're following up a group of subjects from the time of exposure to a particular outcome. Exposure in epidemiological terms uh, uh, denotes a risk factor and outcome is a disease condition. So this is a very intuitive approach to study disease incidence and risk factors. Uh, the importance in epidemiology is because number one, you can study incidence. Incidence, as you all know, is occurrence of a new uh, outcome in an individual, at risk for the individual, uh, for the particular outcome, but is free from that outcome at baseline. So we have an individual who does not have, never had a heart attack, but is at risk to develop a heart attack. A male in his 50s is a diabetic a smoker. You follow up this patient and see when, uh, whether he develops a heart attack. We cannot see this face. Right? It's been moving. Can they hear me? Yes, okay. How do I know? They, we actually put a log in ourselves and say that. So it is out already, no? You can just. Can you see the slides now? We can do it. We can start sharing and we can do it. Now can you see the slide? How do you know everybody can see? Everybody can see. Everybody can see. Use the microphone. No, don't, don't turn off the fan. Do Everything is fine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, we will restart. Uh, good morning, everybody who is uh, listening to me. My name is O.C. Abraham. 
I'm from the Department of Medicine here at Christian Medical College, Vellore. Uh, today's lecture will be on uh, cohort studies. Uh, so this is what I will cover during my lecture. First of all, defining what a cohort study is. Once we have learned that, we will learn about the different types of cohort studies. And once you have learned that, what are the different elements of a cohort study when you are either planning to do a cohort study or analyzing, reviewing a cohort study, what are the different elements? What are the advantages and disadvantages of this particular research design? And we will finally wind up with some real life examples of from the published literature. So this is, uh, uh, what is a cohort study? The cohort is actually a military term. So if you're familiar with the Roman history, ancient Roman history, a Roman army had legions, Roman legionaries they were called. And each legion was composed of multiple cohorts. Cohorts basically meant, like this picture shows, a group of soldiers who marched together into battle. So what does a cohort study mean? Cohort study means you are following up a group of subjects. Instead of a group of soldiers, here you have a group of soldiers. And instead of marching together, we are following them up from the time of exposure to a particular outcome. The exposure can be cigarette smoking and the outcome heart attack. The exposure can be obesity and uh, fracture hip or femur. The exposure can be uh, low fiber intake in the diet and colon cancer. The exposure can be uh, postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy and deep brain thrombosis. So very similar to the soldiers marching together. Here we have a group of subjects whom we are following from exposure to outcome. So they are, we are following them together. That is what cohort means. So this is a very intuitive approach to studying disease incidence and risk factors. Okay? Uh, as practicing clinicians, we are in, in, interested in incidence. Public health professions are uh, interested in incidence. Patients and families are interested in incidents and risk factors. Uh, we always ask when we are undergoing a major surgery, what is my risk of developing a major complication? That's incidence. What is incidence? A new occurrence of a new event in somebody who is at risk. So a patient who never had a heart attack, he keeps on smoking. What is his chance of developing a heart attack? So that is incidence. He develops a heart attack. So it's a 10%, 20%. That's incidence. Risk factors, factors which increase the risk of developing a particular outcome. Fracture neck of FEMA, colon cancer, lung cancer, heart attack, tuberculosis. So how do we start the study? We start with a population at risk. Okay, very, 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 very important. So if you are looking at uh, incidence of endometrial cancer, we start with women, preferably what? beyond 50 because as you know, as the age increases, the risk of cancer increases. No point in studying 14 year old girls. We include women who have intact uteruses, somebody who already had a hysterectomy, there's no point in including them. So start with the population at risk, very, very, very important. And you have to measure the characteristics at baseline. So you, you characterize them at baseline. You measure their cholesterol levels, blood glucose, glycosylated hemoglobin, cigarette smoking history, exercise levels, dietary intake, anything you want to measure. Exposure to ionizing radiation. And then you follow up the population over time. And you measure the outcome by either surveillance or re-examination. We'll give you examples later on as we go along. Okay? And you compare the event rates in people with and without characteristic events. So, the characteristic baseline can be uh, uncontrolled diabetes, diabetic patients with the uncontrolled glucose levels and well controlled diabetes, the risk of developing nephropathy. Or patients who take uh, hormone replacement therapy after menopause, uh, risk of developing uh, deep vein thrombosis or stroke or cancer, breast cancer. It's a very intuitive approach. So you can measure both incidence and risk factors. So very powerful design in epidemiology. So this is a diagrammatic representation. Here the big circle represents the population you want to study. Okay? 
uh, all doctors working in this cemetery called Bellor, or the population of the town of Bellor, or uh, people who are employed by the leather industry in Ambur town near to Bellor. So that's a population. But for issues of feasibility, you cannot uh, study the entire population. So you, from the population, you select a sample, right? Like tank inside the circle. So how do you select the sample? The sample has to be a true representation of the population of interest. So ideally, you should do some kind of random sampling. Okay? So it should never be a systematically chosen sample. So once you have selected the sample, what do you do? You measure all these things at baseline. And based on that measurement, you classify them into two groups, uh, risk factor present and risk factor absent. So the risk factor present is the exposed group and risk factor absent is the control group. Okay, so this is the exposed or this is the unexposed group. So this is based on measurement of uh, uh, anthropometric measurements, obesity, it can be a biochemical parameter, glycosylated hemoglobin or uh, lipid profile, high density lipoprotein. It can be a history of smoking, those who are current smokers and never smokers, uh, those who are exposed to ionizing radiations because they work in a, a, a thermal a nuclear power plant, and uh, those who work in a thermal power plant are not exposed to nuclear uh, ionizing radiations. This has to be very carefully done because if there is a measurement errors, you will introduce bias. Also, the sampling also is very important. If it is not a random, uh, uh, don't ensure that uh, uh, the, the, how you select sample can introduce bias if it's a flawed manner. Then what do you do? You follow up these patients over time from exposure to outcome. Outcome is the disease. So the disease will develop in those risk factors are present. That is the exposed group. This is will also develop in those risk factors are absent, <clears throat> the control group, the unexposed group. And you compare the frequency of disease in both the groups. Okay, this is incidence of disease in the exposed group, and this is incidence of disease in the unexposed group. So inclusion is based on exposure, very important. Uh, unlike a case control study where it is based on exposure and they are all free from the outcome of interest. So you are studying hip fracture, none of them had hip fracture. If you are studying deep vein thrombosis, none of them had deep vein thrombosis. If you are studying colon cancer, none of them had colon cancer at baseline. So they are all free from the outcome of interest at baseline and they are followed over a period of time. Okay? So if you have questions or comments, please type in, in the uh, 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 chat box. Or is everything fine? I would like to hear some responses. Is everybody clear about the basic structure of a cohort design? Right, I don't see any responses. Can a hospital based sample be representative of the population? If you want to study, uh, 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 any particular outcome in, in, in patients who visit the hospital, that's fine. So your uh, uh, question is that um, somebody who comes to the outpatient clinic, the medicine outpatient clinic in medicine OPD, how many of them uh, diabetic patients who attend the outpatient clinic in medicine OPD in CMC, Valor, how many of them will uh, have uh, good glycemic control at the end of one year of treatment? That's a good question. So it depends on your study question. It can be from the general population. It can be from patients who attend the outpatient clinic. It can be from patients who are hospitalized. Uh, it can be uh, patients who work in an industry, leather industry in Ambur. Patients who work in DARC in, uh, in, in, Tam, uh, in, in Chennai. Uh, patients uh, who work, work in a particular uh, industry. All can be. So it depends on your study question. Does that answer your question? I hope so. So now these are the different types of cohort studies. This is what you will find 
most often what is called a prospective cohort or a concurrent cohort study. So this is this big arrow represents time period now. So now you are recruiting patients into the study, measuring the variable at baseline and classifying them as exposed and unexposed. And none of them had the outcome. You are following them up over a period of time. This is future. The blue arrow to my right represents the future. Sometime in the future, they will develop the outcome. Heart attack, cancer, fracture, stroke, dementia, whatever it is. Tuberculosis. So this is a prospective because the, the, time, the, the direction of inquiry is always from exposure to outcome in a cohort study. Always remember this. How did you recruit your patients into the study? Is it based on the exposure? Then it is a cohort study. And you are following them up from exposure to an outcome. So a risk factor to a disease. And this risk factor is now, and the disease is in the future, that is a concurrent or a prospective cohort design. We are going to get all the information from medical records from the MRD department. That is a retrospective cohort. Exposure has happened in the past. Outcome also has happened in the past. But you are recruiting patients as patients who work in radiology department and patients who work in accounts department. Uh, hospital staff who work in radiology department and hospital staff who work in accounts department. Patients who are diabetics and patients who do not have diabetes. Patients who are smokers and patients who do not have smokers. And follow them up about cancer or heart attack or fracture or whatever you do, outcome of this. Okay? So here, your complete study is based on information available in medical records. But it is not from outcome to exposure. You are still recruiting patients as exposed. Exposed to ionizing radiation. Okay? High serum zinc levels low HDL levels in the blood. Okay, then you follow them up over time and see how many are had outcome. So this also you information you get from medical records. So this is called a retrospective cohort study. Uh, some authors don't like the term retrospective because it gives the impression that you are going back from outcome to exposure. Some people use the term historical controls. Okay? So historical cohort study. So those are the uh, two types of study. We will not go into ambidirectional for the time being. So this is to my right is time. So this is concurrent or the prospective of our study. And this is the retrospective of our study, the red arrow. Any questions or comments? Okay, we move on. Uh, cohort studies can be further divided into fixed cohort and dynamic cohort. This is a fixed cohort. Fixed cohort, you recruit every subject at the same period of time, same point in time. So here we have three individuals. The light brown line represents three individuals who are exposed. And the dark brown represents three individuals who are unexposed. And they are followed up for the same period of time. So start at the same time point, followed up for a similar period of time similar length of time. It does not happen in real life. Most often does not happen in real life. And X represents the outcome. So here, two out of the three exposed develop the outcome, and one out of the unexposed, develop, one out of the three unexposed develop the outcome. Okay? So the outcome was twice more as common in the exposed individuals when compared to the unexposed individuals. So this is a risk factor, so there is uh, uh, association with this particular disease, okay? That's a fixed cohort. What about a dynamic cohort? What happens in real life, okay? So here we have, again, three subjects, the light brown lines, who are exposed, and three subjects, the dark brown line, who are unexposed. Exposure is negative. But they are followed up for different periods of time. This is one, two, three, and four years. This subject is followed for a period of three years. This subject is followed up for a period of one year. 
the subject is followed up for a period of one year. So similarly here, this particular individual is followed for the full duration of the study. This individual joined at the inception, followed for three years, then developed the outcome of interest. This individual joined the study one year after the inception, followed up till the conclusion of the study. So individuals may develop the outcome of interest, then you are no longer interested in them because the incidence has occurred. You are always interested in the first occurrence of the disease. Individual may be lost to follow up or migrate. They move to Bihar, never came back to, for any follow up studies. They may die of something else, motor vehicle accident, suicide. So here the denominator is person years of time. Okay, so this individual is followed for three plus one plus four. So four person years and two outcomes occur. Here there is four plus three plus three. Ten person years of time. So this is five, sorry, three plus one plus one. Five person years, two outcomes occur. Here there is ten person years of follow up. Five, four plus three plus three. And two outcomes occur. So here the denominator is person years. So here this is called incidence rate, while this is called cumulative incidence. Hope that is clear to everyone. We'll, we'll give you further examples as you more. So now, what all can you do with the cohort study? Number one, you can study the risk factor. The best and the classical example is the association between tobacco smoking and lung cancer. I'll show you the study later. So this is uh, first uh, derived from a cohort study done in the UK. Prognosis. So once you develop a cancer, what is your survival at five years or follow-up? Once you had a heart attack, what is the probability of survival? A major stroke. Once you develop HIV infection, your survival rate. Uh, you can study prevention interventions, reduction in the incidence of pneumonia after pneumococcal vaccination. You can look at the effect of treatment, survival after antiretroviral treatment, HIV treatment. So, a powerful design. You can study a risk factor. You can study the prognosis of a particular disease. You can look at prevention interventions. You can look at treatment interventions. A very powerful design. Now, moving on to how do you measure incidence? Cumulative incidence is uh, simply designed, uh, defined as number of new cases of disease. Very important, number of new cases. So you exclude prevalent cases at baseline. So you exclude everybody who already have heart attacks or fracture or brain thrombosis or cancer. And you include only the new cases. Okay, everybody is free from disease. You follow them for one year or five years or ten years. How many of them develop with the new, new disease? Divided by the total number of people at risk. Total number of people. So that's called cumulative incidence. Uh, when you have person years of time in a dynamic cohort, you have the number of new cases which develop in a given period of time divided by the total person time of observation. So here, in this example, we have five individuals, subjects A, B, C, D, and E. They followed up for different periods of time. So they contribute to 9.5 years of person years of observation time. That's the total years at risk. So, so between these five individuals, they contribute for 9.5 years of observation. So that's the period of risk. And how many of them develop the outcome of interest? Let it be fractured, two. So two by 9.5 person years is the incidence density or incidence rate. Here you have person time in the denominator. The cumulative incidence versus incidence density. You should be very clear about this. So let's take an example here. Uh, this is a, a real study published in 1987. So this uh, uh, author recruited middle-aged black men, African-American men, in this particular county in the United States of America, Evans County. So the baseline was ECG abnormality. So once he recruited all the subjects, he, he looked, uh, uh, recorded an ECG in all the subjects. 
and classified them as ECG abnormality present and ECG abnormality not present. So it was the presence of Q waves. So eight had uh, ECG abnormality present, uh, 47 had ECG abnormality present, and 144 did not have ECG abnormality present. So this is the exposed group, 47, and this is the controlled group. What is the outcome of interest? They were followed up for a period of 10 years. Did they die from coronary heart disease, CHD? So 18 of them died of coronary heart disease and 173 of them did not die of coronary heart disease. And this is how the two by two table. So what is the box A represent? A represents exposed who developed the outcome. So patients who had a ECG abnormality who died from coronary heart disease. What is uh, cell B represent? Cell B represents exposed who did not develop the outcome of interest. Okay. So ECG abnormality present, but they survived the 10 years. What is cell C? Cell C, no ECG abnormality, unexposed, but died from coronary heart disease. And what is cell D? ECG abnormality not present. Uh, no pure waves uh, and did not die from coronary artery disease. Okay. So, how do we calculate relative risk? Relative risk is incidence of disease in the exposed group divided by incidence of disease in the non exposed group. So, can someone tell me what is the incidence of disease in the exposed group here? Yes, that's correct. And what is the incidence of disease in the unexposed group? Incidence of disease in the unexposed group. That's correct. Good. So what is the relative risk? Comparison of these two incidences. Incidence in the incidence of disease in the exposed group divided by incidence of disease in the non-exposed group. So 8 by 47 divided by 10 by 144, which will work out to about, let's say approximately 2.5. So 2.5 is the relative risk. What does that mean? What does relative risk mean? 2.5 is the relative risk. So in this particular study, the relative risk is 2.5, 2.45. So in this particular study, it means that among middle-aged black men who are residents of Evans County, if you have a ECG abnormality, you are two and a half times more likely to die from coronary heart disease when compared to Similar men, middle-aged black men residing in Evans County who do not have any ECG abnormality. Okay, so if you have an ECG abnormality, you are two and a half times more likely to die when compared to men who do not have an ECG abnormality. It's a relative risk. It's never an. It's not an absolute risk. Very important to remember. It is not an absolute risk, it's a relative risk. It's two and a half times more likely to die from coronary artery disease when compared to, in comparison to men who do not have disease in the abnormality. Very important point to remember, relative risk. Okay? Others can fool you, pharma companies can fool you, they only quote the relative risk, they never quote the absolute risk. So any questions or comments on relative risk? Uh, the comment is correct. How much more is it likely in the exposed group when compared to the unexposed group? That's very important. When compared, in comparison. Okay. So in epidemiology, you are always making comparisons. So remember that. How many times more likely to occur when compared to the unexposed group? Can I move on if there are no comments? 
Then estimation of we also want to calculate the attributable risk. Attributable risk for AR is IE minus IO divided by IE. That is incidence in the exposed group minus the incidence in the unexposed group. The difference. The difference in the incidence between the exposed and the unexposed group divided by the incidence in the exposed group. So what does it tell you? Well, let's take an example. So this is smoking and lung cancer. So our baseline is population of 10,000 individuals. You measured, classified them into smokers and non-smokers based on a history. So this is the exposure. So if smoking is present, they are the exposed group. So 7,000, 70 percent of this 10,000 were smoked. They are exposed. And non-smokers never smoked. That is the unexposed group. And the outcome is lung cancer after 20 years of follow up. Okay, so 73 developed lung cancer, 9,927 did not lung cancer. So now we have to calculate the relative risk. What's the relative risk? Relative risk is? Can I have some answers from the listeners, please? Incidence in the exposed divided by incidence in the unexposed. Okay. I know it's a Saturday morning. <laughs> so it's 10. Okay. So the interpretation is that lung cancer is 10 times more common among smokers than among non smokers. So it's a Relative risk. Okay. Attributable risk is incidence in the exposed minus the incidence in the unexposed divided by the incidence in the exposed. 0 0.9 or 90 percent. What does it mean? 90 percent of the cases of lung cancer among smokers are attributed to the habit of smoking. Remember, all smokers do not develop lung cancer. And even among smokers who develop lung cancer, not all of it is due to smoking. Some is due to spontaneous mutations, bad luck, okay, or family history or some other cause, chemical exposure, radiation exposure. So attributable risk means what proportion of the outcome is attributed to the particular risk factor. So here, 0.9 or 90% means 90% of all lung cancers among smokers are attributed to the habit of smoking. Smoking is a very important risk factor for mm -hmm. development of lung cancer. So that is clear. We'll move on. Now, what are the advantages of a cohort study? Temporal sequence between the cause and outcome is very clear. Okay? Uh, because you are always recruiting patients based on their exposure status and they are free from the outcome. We're looking at incident cases. So the outcome is new disease occurring in patients who are free from the disease. And you're recruiting them as cases who have the risk factor present, uh, patients who have the risk factor present, and patients who do not have the risk factor. So very clear, always the horse is before the car. Okay? So you're following up from exposure to disease. So the temporal sequence is maintained. So this is very important to establish. Causality. In the case control design, uh, you can only say it's only an association. It does not always prove causality. Very important point. And it measures disease incidence. Remember, incidence means, in simple English, it means who gets the disease. It's important for clinicians, patients, families, public health professionals. So you are measuring the risk. Okay. So if I take this tablet, will I have a side effect? You are looking at the incidence of uh, side effects of this particular treatment. Okay, If I do this operation, will I die or will I become paralyzed or will I become all right? So you're looking at incidence of death after this major surgery, incidence of becoming paralyzed after this surgery. So very powerful design because it can measure incidence. Okay, Occurrence of a new disease, somebody who is free from it at baseline but who is at risk to develop the disease. Okay? You can study the natural history. So, very famous or infamous, I would say, 
Tuskegee study uh, in the early 1900s, uh, black Americans, African Americans who developed syphilis uh, were never given the treatment and followed up uh, by primarily by white American doctors to look at the natural history of uh, syphilis. Okay, you can study the natural history of uh, any disease uh, by following them up from exposure to this. Uh, it's useful to study the history of rare exposures. It's useful to investigate multiple outcomes. And then if you do it carefully, you minimize uh, bias, provided you, you, you know, baseline measurements, uh, follow up, uh, outcome assessment, all are done in an objective fashion, you can minimize bias also. What are the limitations? Number one, it is inefficient for rare diseases. Because uh, you're studying a very rare uh, congenital disease, a rare form of cancer. Because to get enough number of subjects is very difficult. Okay? You have to follow up a huge number of patients for many years of time. So this will involve uh, immense investments in terms of cost, time, other resources, personnel. So it's a very uh, resource intense way of studying diseases. Confounding. So you are only interested in the, the exposure variable. But there may be other uh, variables at baseline which are associated with the disease. Confounding variables. Okay? Uh, we are looking at the association of smoking and lung cancer. The patient may also be an ethanol consumer. Uh, the patient may have other behaviors which put him at risk for cancer or heart attack or stroke. So you're not measuring those variables, so confounding is an issue. Bias. When you recruit patients, can be a biased sample if they're not truly really representative of the population you want to study. If the measurement is flawed, you can bias them at baseline. Uh, the way you ascertain the outcome, cancer or deep vein thrombosis or fracture or death, uh, it can be biased. And uh, probably the, the Achilles seal of of uh, uh, cohort studies uh, lost to follow. Uh, you know, patients are notorious. They don't want to come back, uh, whether it is for treatment or for study purpose. So if you lose more than 10 or 15% of the subjects in the study, uh, your conclusions are going to be invalid or it's going to seriously hamper the validity of conclusions. So a good cohort study, uh, you put in lots of efforts to make sure that your patients are not lost to follow. What all can you do? We make sure that uh, uh, the geographical area from their recruited is fairly close by. Uh, you may give them incentives to come back for follow-up. Uh, you may have use a telephone or some other way of reminding them to come back for follow-up. So, loss to follow-up is probably the most important issue apart from cost and time. Confounding and time. Confounding. Uh, there are issues. Bias. Uh, if you're careful. Uh, uh, about the procedures at baseline and as a treatment outcome, you can minimize the bias to the minimum. Now, uh, moving on to the last part of my, my, my talk, I think all of you should get hold of this particular article and read it. This is published in uh, British Medical Journal in 1954, The Mortality of Doctors in Relation to Their Smoking Habits, a preliminary report uh, by Richard Dahl and Austin Bradford Hill. This is a classic. Uh, this is a study among British physicians. Uh, very simple study. Uh, they went to the uh, uh, British Medical Council, got the details of all the currently active doctors, sent them a questionnaire asking about their smoking habits. Okay? So smoking was the exposure variable. So they classified them into smokers and non-smokers based on a question. So the population was British doctors. And here they didn't sample, they studied everybody who was active on the roads. And uh, after uh, five years, uh, they looked at the death registry and found out how many of them had died of autopsy proven lung cancer. Uh, proven lung cancer, not autopsy proven, proven lung cancer. So the death from lung cancer was the outcome of interest. And this study conclusively proved that tobacco smoking is associated with death from lung cancer, a classic. And 
with Richard Dawn was a physician and the Bradford Hill was a statistician, classic. And many of you have probably heard of the Framingham Heart Study. Framingham is a county in Massachusetts and US of A. The study started in 1948, and still going on, 70 years. So the objectives were risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So lots of what we know about risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Uh, high cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, uh, dyslipidemia, sedentary activity, obesity, sedentary lifestyle of obesity, all, most of it has come from Birmingham Heart Study. So they recruited adults between the ages of 30 and 60, two years of age, and they sampled 5,200 out of the 10,000 residents. So this was the population, 10,000. This was the sample, 5,200. And uh, they, they did not include adults less than the age of 30 years because their risk of developing a cardiovascular disease is extremely low. So the risk is higher among this particular group. But baseline, they had detailed medical history. They all had a physical examination. There are lots of laboratory tests drawn, glucose, lipid profile, ECG, lots of it. And they were followed every two years for the next 30 years. And uh, this is what it shows. Uh, annual incidence of incidence of coronary heart disease in Framingham, Massachusetts. As you can see here among men, as the blood pressure went up, the incidence of coronary heart disease was higher. It was a dose response relationship. Blood pressure less than 120, 150 to 139, 140 to 159, 160 to 129, and High systolic blood pressure is a risk factor for development of coronary artery disease. Even in women, uh, similar relationship, but much more pronounced in men. So there's an interaction between gender and blood pressure also. So this is uh, uh, another study from uh, Korea, which uh, compared two treatment strategies. So this is, uh, this is a study for risk factor this is the study of, uh, again, a risk factor uh, for atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. So this is comparison of two treatments at the stent percutaneous procedure versus cabbage, bypass drafting for left main coronary artery disease. And uh, so here the subjects were patients with left main coronary artery disease. And this is from a registry. They had a registry. Exposure was stent, control was the cabbage, outcome was uh, death. And as you can see, uh, there is no significant difference in the death rate, 1.18. Uh, so, so it doesn't matter whether you treat the patient with a stent or a bypass drafted, the outcome of death is similar among patients uh, treated both ways. So I conclude my lecture there. Uh, thank you all for patient listening. If you have questions or comments, you can type it in the chat box now. Thank you.